Um, so pretty much what I'm going to do is do like an introduction of the Whit Sundays, uh, talk about the geological history, how the Whit Sundays came about, and how the reef was formed. And pretty much we need to understand the history to really uh, protect and preserve the future. So before I get started though, so um, I am a Master Reef Guide and Savannah Guide. Um, like you mentioned before, yeah, the only one so far and the first person in Australia with both our accreditations um, to understand what they are, uh, what both means. Our Master Reef Guide, we're ambassadors of the Great Barrier Reef. We work alongside um, Queensland Government and uh, Grumpa, like Marine Parks, and do a lot of data collecting surveys and workshops to pretty much educate uh, everyday people and future generations. Um, Savannah Guides are protectors um, of the and interpreters of the outback and we work alongside different indigenous groups and also uh, look at the flora and fauna side of things. So our dream is pretty much to connect sea and land together. And I work for Red Cat Adventures. Um, some of you guys might know um, who they are. We're a family-based business uh, based in the Whitsundays and Mackay. Um, we do a few different tours around the Whitsundays and also to Cedar Creek Fall and Mackay region. So that's pretty much what I do. So we're going to unearth a little bit of history for the future. Um, as I mentioned, we're just going to take a little bit of a step back in time, uh, take a step back to how the Whitsundays came to be. So let's take a step back in time and to understand the Whitsunday landscape, we need to go back around 110 million years ago. So that is a very long time. Um, at the time, there was uh, uh, heaps of volcanoes active around this area, all around Australia. And um, slowly but steady, movements of the Earth's crust were breaking up the supercontinent of Gondwana, um, which originally included the present day Australia, uh, New Zealand, New Guinea, South America, Africa, etc. So the Whitsunday laid in this geological volcanic zone. So uh, for 37 million years, as all these volcanoes were, were active around here, and in a 50 million year period, those volcanoes in the Whitsundays were continuously active. Um, so with the volcanoes here, they were considered some of the most desolating and most destructive, pretty much the Pompeii. Um, and that's how some of our islands were formed. So through the volcanic rocks, the ash, blowing up into the air, pretty much ejecting minerals, um, materials uh, out onto the surface as thick as one kilometers. Um, over the century, all that solidified and made the bedrock that we see today. Um, all the fragments welted together and hardened the rocks, and you can see all the different contrasting co colors around the Whitsundays, and that's all your pretty much volcanic rock. Alrighty. So Mother Nature kept falling as well, and there was all these lava flowing through different cracks and craters and um, created all these dikes that you can actually see around the Whitsundays. The most popular one around here is uh, off Hook Island, the wood pile, and it actually looks like stacks of wood on top of each other. And what that was was a lava flow that shot out, collapsed, and created these dikes. Um, some of the most common ones, or most popular ones you'll see, are also around other islands around the Sundays. Pentecost Island is like one of the largest dikes that can be seen around here. But it's not necessarily actually believed to be part of an ancient volcano, but it is still really, really cool to see. Um, and then you also got some of your other surrounding islands like Gloucester, Hayman, Shaw, and Derwent. So, what do we believe that the Whit Sundays looked like uh, millions and millions of years ago? Firstly, so all the islands are continental islands, so are actually part of the continent of Australia. But right where we are, they believe that it was kind of like a low surface with all these mountain ridge lines with kind of uh, circular craters in like little slopes. And what happens over the, like that time, the volcanoes erupted and pretty much lifted up all the pretty much the mountains out of the ground. Uh, it kind of looked like similar to northern end of New Zealand. Uh, so where the islands are there, that's what the area used to look like. So as I was mentioning, the rocky islands of the Whitsundays are continental islands. That is a what's part of the continent of Australia, unlike other coral caves found in parts of the Great Barrier Reef, which form your reef shingles. So the Whitsunday um, islands that we see today were part of a main, um, mainland mountain range. So a little bit of fun fact in history. So as I was mentioning, um, going back to where the uh, how the reef will slowly get formed very soon. Um, over millions of years, these mountains were separated and then rejoined from the mainland. Separated, rejoined with the last ice age or few of the ice age. The sea level rose, then came down, rose and sand came down. Uh, pretty much. Uh, 
looking at the coastal lines in the driest period, uh, you would see that the eastern coastal line was actually about 200 kilometers east of where we are now too. But with the forever, forever changing like coastlines, um, with the last ice age about 10,000 years ago was pretty much the recent change that we got. And that's what we see to this day. So with the glaciers mounting and the coral sea roads over the coastal plains, leaving all the mountain tops and ridges that we see to this day. Pretty beautiful. But, so with all these volcanic activities, um, a lot of people think, where did our beautiful silica white sand come from? Um, there's been so many different theories, especially with myself as a tour guide. The theories that I've heard was parrotfish poo, parrotfish eat coral, pull out sand. It doesn't pull out 98% silica white sand, and there, there needs to be a lot of parrotfish to produce that amount of sand. Um, the other thing that a lot of people used to say too, uh, when you're actually at the Hill Inlet Lookout, um, the in between Hazelwood Island and the South Inlet Sunday Island is considered one of the deepest section. It goes from about 39 meters to 129 meters. And what a lot of people um, used to believe is that's where the sand came from. Unfortunately, that's not actually true. So as stated, the rocky outcrops in the Wildwood Sunday Islands are remnants of this volcano. But a quick look at the rocks and minerals in Tung Bay and also the south end of Whitehaven Beach shows that the weathering rocks hasn't produced that sand that we see there. Um, the only, the little bit of quartz stones you see um, to this day is only really microscopic and it isn't what was created um, for Whitehaven Beach. Um, but where it actually came from, which I'll talk about very soon, uh, is from out further out where the volcanoes used to be and it's like a kind of slip, like a conveyor belt. Uh, all the current brings all this beautiful sand and silica quartz stone sand um, to where the inlet is now. Uh, there has been marine surveys that reveals that 1.85 billion tonnes of sand resides in the Whitsunday area and that was just um, deposited here in the last 10,000 years. Uh, so that's all that we have um, to this day, is what the sand we got there is what we have left, but there's such an abundance that we're not going to run out any time soon. Um, it is believed that the longshore drift, a process in which the current moving along the shore operates like a conveyor belt, as I mentioned before, delivering this quartz stones um, to number beaches around the Sundays, well, um, which waves and tides keep, over, um, keep the sand ever on the move. The beaches that accumulate small amounts of quartz have lost, uh, lost a bit of sand in time, but the Whitsun, uh, Whitsundays and Whitehaven Beach is so richly endowed that even in the last you know, approximately 5,000 years, there's still enough to cover Whitehaven Beach and the Hill Inlet. Um, the sand in the uh, Hill Inlet and the sand on actual Whitehaven Beach is uh, pretty much the same. It's suitable for making fine glass and um, optical lenses. You probably heard rumours about NASA and the Hubble telescope. That hasn't been 100% confirmed, but um, the sand there has been pretty much, uh, is that pure that you can make really fine glass with it. In 1962, leases were given out um, to take sand out of the inlet and a bit of dredging. Uh, they were only recommending to remove over a thousand tonnes per month, but fortunately those leases ran out and they lapsed and uh, they did continue that. So imagine if they kept dredging a thousand tonnes a month, we wouldn't have the Hill Inlet Lookout or Whitehaven Beach to this day. Um, and because they did dredge it, we now get a lot of beautiful uh, different systems or ecosystems and uh, different wildlife. So there's now approximately 12 different mangroves found in the inlet um, itself, along with around the surrounding islands. Uh, lots of local and migrating birds, seabirds, your terns, or pied oyster catchers, um, also your stone coolies reside on, um, in the inlet there. And with the mangrove system, it's a perfect nursery for our juvenile marine life. Uh, there are also four different species of seagrass. We do seagrass monitoring around wet Sundays, um, which is a perfect ecosystem for your dugongs and other wildlife. <laughs> there have been other cultural sites found um, with the marine parks doing their walks um, and a lot of artefacts that have been discovered too and a lot of other hidden gems that still need to be discovered to this day. So, with all the beautiful ecosystem, the Great Barrier Reef is like uh, a life like no other. And so what we're going to do now is take a little dive in and see what you can see around the Whitsundays. So now we know and understand the geological site of how the Whitsundays came to be, all those beautiful islands that 
um, we can explore. There's 74 of them. And around some of these islands are fringing reefs. So the coral reefs are formed in the clear waters around the continental islands, occasionally along the mainland too. There's hundreds and hundreds of different species of coral found in the marine parks. And while you're exploring these uh, coral reefs, um, like the most popular activity to do is actually physically get in the water and go snorkeling. Um, since the cyclone, some of the best snorkeling location is on the northern end of the Whitsunday Islands. So you've got the top end of Pork Island, Hayman Island and Black Island. Um, uh, again, because of the cyclone, a lot of the bays there um, got heavily impacted on the southern end. On the northern end is where you get your really beautiful pristine reefs. The, reef, um, the fringing reefs contain an extraordinary diverse community of marine life. It's really mind blowing to think that one of the largest organisms or largest sorry, living structure in the world is made up of some of the most minute and uh, smallest organisms. So whilst you're in the water, you're gonna come across two pretty much uh, main types of coral, your hard and your soft coral. So a bit of a coral information for you. Um, hard coral has the limestone skeletal, um, skeletal system. They pretty much don't move around in the current, makes it really easy to identify. There's a few different examples that look very similar to their shape. You've got your brain coral, your boulder coral, your branching coral. Fun fact, with your boulder coral, they only grow about a centimetre a year, and there's some boulder corals that are like hundreds and hundreds of years old around the wet Sundays. So take your time exploring them. And the other type of coral, you've got your soft coral, which don't have that hard uh, skeletal system, and they do move around in the current, and you do see some nice little crit um, critters in between them. So take your time. The slower you go, the more you are going to see. We have the larger tidal movements around the wet Sundays and that perfect kind of temperature between that 20 and 30 degrees. Um, we do have a home to some of the most diverse coral systems and habitats here. So, not only do a lot of people come here to the wet Sundays for a holiday destination, a lot of our marine life does as well. So, we do get a lot of our humpback whales. Uh, we've unearthed the geological makings of Whitsundays along with diving in some parts of Great Barrier Reef. With diversity comes with many different visitors. May, um, this makes the region even more special uh, for the migrating animals that choose the warmer waters and the tropics for their winter getaway. Uh, each year we have our seasonal animals and the southern humpback whales are one of the most popular ones that people want to see. Um, they come from their feeding grounds in Antarctica and the cold, colder waters and migrate north uh, to seek a bit of shelter to mate and give birth to their calf because they don't have enough fat to keep them insulated. You do see them uh, hug the reef a bit and uh, if you're very fortunate enough you might see a mama with a little calf teaching her how to breathe and stay on top of the water surface. Um, and they do like to play, they do breach um, tail uh, slaps and if you're snorkeling along some of the reef edges you can hear them sing which is very, very cool. Manta rays also migrate uh, to the wet Sundays in the cooler seasons. These gentle marine creatures can be seen along the fringing reef, um, especially in the incoming tide where all the nutrients and food sources they need are coming in with them. As they feed, they do tend to barrel roll, which is a very magical thing. If you're fortunate enough to be swimming along a fringing reef and encounter a manta ray, uh, be warned, sometimes they do barrel roll around you, which is a cool thing to encounter too. Uh, they are filter feeders. A lot of people do get them mixed up with stingrays. They're absolutely harmless. Don't stress. You won't end up like Steve Irwin with these guys. Um, they are quite gentle creatures, and they're really elegant when they do dance around in the current and up in the waves. Um, we have turtles here, obviously. There's seven different species of marine turtles, and we get six of those seven here in um, Whit Sundays. You don't often see them on Whitehaven Beach purely because of the silica sand. Turtles need warm sand to incubate their eggs. You might see a couple here and there, but not a prominent number. You get a lot of other turtles around, so turtles around the other parts of the islands, especially Langford Island there. Um, during their mating season, uh, October, November, they do get quite inquisitive and might give you a little bit of a bump to suss you out before they realise you're not the type of turtle they want to see. Another fun <laughs> fact, uh, if you see a turtle with a very large tail, he's just a very happy boy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, with well over 1,500 species of uh, uh, reef fish, Oh, even more than that probably, uh, with a variety of colours and behaviours, you'll never get bored while you're exploring the coral um, reefs here in the pristine waters. 
As you slowly drift along the edge of the reef, you will be welcomed by your butterfly fish, batfish, blue tang, sergeant majors, giant trevallies, um, parrotfish and marry rats, especially George and Manta Ray Bay that most people know. If we, a few of you haven't gone out on the water yet, there's marry rats is bigger than me that know nothing about personal space. So definitely uh, get in the water and have some fun. But the list doesn't end there. There's dolphins, giant sea clams, starfish, and dugongs. We do get a lot of dugongs around the front here and along in Tung Bay because there's heaps of sea grass along there. Um, so this incredible ecosystem enormous ecosystem can be seen from space and it's a place like no other. Being one of the largest natural living structures <coughs> on the planet, it is important to us as individuals to understand the origin, the history and how the reef and the islands were formed. Uh, to protect and preserve and sustain the vibrant marine, marine cities the, and the reef architectures and um, builders. Um, as we are all still unearthing and discovering more, one, um, more of the wonders of the 2300 Kilometers stretch of the Great Barrier Reef, it is important to us to preserve and protect what we have already uncovered, especially when the Whit Sundays is considered the heart of the reef um, and being a World Heritage listed site. Uh, high standard tour operators such as Red Cat Adventures, Ocean Rafting, Cruise Whit Sundays, Marine Bios, Masters, Master Reef Guides, anyone like yourself with the love of the ocean. We do these workshops so we can help educate, help provide this information to make a bigger and a better difference to our environment. Using websites like Eye on the Reef that Crystal will talk about very soon helps individuals and people like myself gather further information for research. Even to just mapping a single turtle in a bay definitely helps. Um, government funding school programs, reef catchment, talking to your marine parks, doing surveys, anything like that does contribute and help. Um, you can contact your local marine parks, people um, and any high standard tour operators, master reef guys, there is a map there of how many we've got here in the Whit Sundays. Um, anything to do with uh, getting involved with protecting our slice of haven uh, definitely helps. And people like myself and um, high standard tour operators do programs to work alongside government to uh, help do be a marine bio programs for schools and also do programs like this. Um, so I want to say thank you yeah, um, for joining us today, letting me do this presentation. Thank you so much for bringing me in today. I represent Master Reef Garden Savannah, guys. And um, not only is this place a little bit special for me, it is my hometown. Um, I'm born and bred local, so it's not only the heart of the reef, but it's the heart of me. And I do appreciate being able to come here today and showcase it. So thank you for joining. <laughs>